evening and welcome to Will the Kids Be Okay? My name is Keith Rose. I'm your moderator for this, our 39th Our Health event. A special warm welcome to our huge live audience in the Capitol. <laughs> it feels so good to welcome your return. And we also welcome our virtual audience who will be watching us on TV or online. Now let me introduce our three amazing, energetic speakers. Ashley Knight has kindly offered to step in for Haley McLean. Haley was the principal from Georgian Bay District Secondary School who was supposed to be here tonight, but she couldn't make it. So thank you, Ashley, for coming. Ashley is the vice principal at Georgian Bay District Secondary School. Uh, prior, to, she's been in that position about three years. Prior to that, she was a teacher over many schools in high schools around in the Simcoe County area. And her primary subjects were science, math, and special ed. If I got that right, good. So, so welcome and thanks very much for standing with me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Rich Birch, the guy in the middle there with a funny little thing on his chin, <laughs> is passionate about helping young leaders launch into their lives. And for the last several years, has been the camp director at Camp Mini Yo Wee. Did I say that? That's great. Okay. Okay. Mini Yo Wee in Muskoka. So he's just getting gearing up for the summer and he's got lots of ideas. So welcome, Rich. <laughs> Rob Meter is a pediatrician and the medical director of Family and Youth Mental Health at Waypoint. Rob has been here before, so he knows the ropes. He was here a year ago, actually 11 months ago, talking about mental health and addictions in the time of COVID. And at that time, I looked at the tape the other night, we were on wave three, Rob. Okay. And I think we only had two, I've lost vaccinations, it. two vaccinations, so you know, here we are a year later, and yes. we're counting, okay? <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be interested, you said something uh, that stuck with me. You talked about kids and the elastics are snapping. Mm. So it'll be interesting to hear what's happened a year later and how you feel about that. So where that where that's at. So. Mm -hmm. There are more detailed biographies on our speakers in your brochure. Take a look at them, and there's a list of references there and resources that you can get, uh, look at back to later in the event. So, so some collective thank yous just before we start to our advisory committee members, and specifically to Sandy Voucher. Sandy, raise your hand in the audience there, who uh, spearheaded this program. <laughs> to our seven local sponsors, who will acknowledge a little later on in the program and to the extraordinary staff here at the Midland Cultural Center and, of course, at Rogers TV. So thank you to all of you. I have one quick announcement which I was asked to make, and I think it's an important one. The blood donor clinic in this area is now being held here in the Midland Cultural Center, and the next blood donor clinic is Saturday, June the 4th, and that's one week before the Butter Tart Festival. So thank you for Festival. We had a great turnout in the one a uh, couple of weeks, couple of weeks ago here, and that's going to be a continuous every two months. They're going to be congregating here on the Saturdays, and more dates will become available. During my discussions with the speakers, I plan to ask some of the questions that we've received from you, the audience members, in advance. Thank you for sending them. Let's start with a couple little comments. Um, all kids, parents grandparents have been affected by the challenges of the last two years. We've never experienced such a long time period when our kids and our grandparents' kids have faced anxiety, stress, sometimes depression, and all of this brought on by worries about are they going to be sick, what's changing next, their relationships, what's happening to my education, and now we have a war in Europe just to add to that stress. Have our kids been able to find help? Have they been able to stay resilient? We're going to hear from our experts tonight. As well, although public health restrictions may be ending publicly now, most places have reduced them almost totally, how will our kids adjust to these changes yet again? How, how well have they learned their flexibility? and resilience. Great life lessons, but uh, tough times. Anyway, enough from me. Let's hear from our speakers. 
I've asked each one of them if they'll talk about the impact of the last two years, this segment that we've taken away from kids and made very different than the earlier expectations, different than certainly when we were there. And whether your kid be preschool, whether they be public school, whether they be high school, in your domain, so Ashley in, in the school environment, Rob in the camp and outside activity environment, Rich, <laughs> and, and Rob in your world of uh, parenting and uh, counseling. Let's leave it at that. Mm -hmm. So Ashley, you get to go first. OK. Um, so we've seen, we've gone from a drastic shift in uh, being in person to online learning when COVID initially hit. Um, and then a lot of transitions the next year of online learning and in classroom. Uh, students have, I would say, been incredibly resilient. We've shifted from a four period day to a one period all week. Um, quadmester where you flip from one period to a second period, then we flipped to two periods a day and now we've gone back to four periods a day. Um, and all, all the while they have participated, they've tried, um, they've adjusted to online learning. Um, I've, I've seen huge growth in our staff and our students in all of those areas. Um, they've worn masks, they've followed arrows, they've followed protocols. Um, they, they keep shifting. We had our first in-person function on Tuesday, which was a staff student hockey game. Um, the energy there was fantastic. Um, it was really nice to see so many students involved. We had a, a skate prior to that. So I would say that many of our students over the last two years have been so impressive in everything that they've done and adjusted with. Um, online learning isn't enjoyable for many students and they um, kept doing it. They kept, you know, taking our phone calls and asking for help when they needed it. We connected them to a teacher to help them, um, and they and they just kept going, which was it was massive um, because if, when you attend and try, good things happen. So, um, so it, I would say that uh, quite impressive uh, the the resili resiliency of our youth right now. Um, I think they're a little fatigued. I know we're all glad to be back to four periods a day, glad to be back into in-person learning, um, and, uh, and glad to be moving forward with uh, more hands-on based learning right now. So I've seen, uh, we've seen great things. So are you back to similar processes that you had two years ago, or have you adjusted some of those processes by what's gone on for the last two years? So uh, we're, uh, Similar, we've all all teachers have online course shells now, because if students do get sick, then they need to be home, maybe engaging in that work at home. Um, so every every teacher now has an online platform um, where they're communicating um, work for the day. Students can complete assignments and submit them virtually. Uh, so we've shifted that way. That. Um, We've also shifted in our assessment of, of or our requests, so no longer is there just a test in a class. Uh, there's many opportunities for them to uh, show achievement through assignments and submit those assignments. So, uh, so no, we're not fully back to protocols pre-COVID, um, but, uh, and I don't know, I, I think those online shells will continue. I, I think it's great um, for students to be able to navigate technology and use it for the 21st century. So, okay. um, so not fully back, but similar. Okay, carry on. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Um, how do you, when you're with kids right now, um, what markers do you use to know that you can actually run a classroom, you can teach, you can have things reasonably safe in all the other worlds, all the other ways you keep your school safe? How do you know you have enough staff? Do you ever have enough staff? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, how do I know I have enough staff? So, uh, you know, we have. In the regular classroom, there's class caps. Those are set based on, on uh, expectations of what students can learn with supports from teachers. If students are, are finding that that class is overwhelming, um, there are many spaces within a school that they can go to get a quiet setting and additional supports. Um, some go to a special education room. Some go to a student success room. 
We have uh, in a few schools now an indigenous student success room with supports in place, um, library guidance. So I would say, um, you know, I, we have EA supports. Our EAs are around our building frequently. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I'll always take more staff, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, can you ever have enough? No. Um, I know we have social workers in our building, um, whether they be school-based social workers or community-based social workers. Um, so students are getting um, some men more mental health supports than they normally do or have in the past. Um, so, uh, yeah. So you've, you've shifted to a team-based approach, essentially, right? yeah. with several levels of being up. Fair enough. Uh, something that we had to learn to do in medicine, and I don't think sometimes we do it perfectly. Is that right, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Other things that you biggest impact on kids that you've seen? Biggest? I would say um, there's still a great deal of fear for students, some students coming back into the building and to in-person learning. Um, uh, many students we've worked on transition plans, as you're saying, in a team approach of trying to get them in one or two periods for the day. How can we support them um, slowly working back into an in-person learning? Um, I would say the largest impact, I, we're seeing increases in social anxiety and anxiety. We are seeing increases in substance abuse, mainly vaping and e-cigarettes. Um, that has been a fairly drastic increase in the last probably four years. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I would say that there's a substantial impact there in, in terms of, of what we're seeing in the building and then we do have to take a team approach. There's lots of conversations with parents and lots of conversations with our, our entire team to work out a strategies and plans for those students. But the, the two biggest things I think we're seeing the most is, is getting students to the building and attending classes every day on a regular basis, so getting back into that routine, and then and some, we're seeing a great deal of substance use. When somebody doesn't show up for a period, what, what triggers that you need to make a phone call or you need to follow up and and what can you do about it anyway? Oh well, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, we have a tiered approach, so teachers are the first line. So if a student's been absent for a day or so, teachers reach out um, to the parents and the student determining um, where they are. If a student starts to show that they're not attending multiple periods, then it becomes... Um, we have a student, we have a referral system and we meet as a student success team. We discuss who is the caring adult for that student. Um, and and it's, it's a, I think in our last student success meeting, we had 15 people present for the meeting to determine our best strategies for those students. The caring adult then reaches out um, to say, hey, what's going on? In many cases, it's uh, maybe feeling overwhelmed that they're behind on their work. So then fear of going into the class because they're behind on their work. Um, some, sometimes it might be, um, they, there might be some conflict with another student in that class. And so then, you know, we work towards uh, finding a solution or helping them get caught up in the work and then getting back into that classroom. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, our administration will come in if, if none of those are working, then it becomes a, a bigger conversation with the parents. Um, we might elicit the support of an attendance counselor. An attendance counselor works with students and families um, that might be really struggling with attending the building. So she'll, we'll work at alternative plans. Uh, maybe the student needs to um, have home instruction or uh, maybe they need an alternative learning space. So we do have some alternative schools in the area uh, that students can participate in um, if, if that is the right decision for them. So uh, we have also had some significant success with co-op. Um, some of our students in, in even our junior grades in grade 10, the building might not be the right place for them in this moment. And so they're out on a co-op placement and getting work experience um, and, and building a huge amount of confidence. Mm -hmm. So co-op has been, um, and the businesses that are supporting our co-op students have been wonderful. Um, they're understanding that some days aren't great days, other days students are there. And then as we find with most of our co-op placements, students get a lot. Um, 
a lot happier. I just see a lot more. Can I assume uh, that many of these place things were in place pre-COVID, yep. and so you just either had to ramp them up or you've been aware and um, heightened uh, awareness and um, is there been a whole lot more activities to, to create some special platforms for some of the, some of the students? Uh, yeah, so uh, yes, we've had to ramp up. Yes, attendance and, and, and uh, credit accumula accumulation has diminished. Uh, yes, we've had to ramp up. Um, so we had a lot more students taking summer co-op credits this summer. We've had, um, we have some night credits running right now. Uh, we've had uh, summer, summer school courses running. We also have dual credit and uh, we, we've joined with the colleges. So we have more students taking these dual credits where they get a college credit and they get a high school credit. Um, that's in addition to their time. So I have a lot of grade 12 students um, in order to get them to graduation this June are taking multiple dual credit courses. So all of them have ramped up. There's more sections, more options. Um, and then as a team, we're looking at like a jigsaw puzzle for each student trying to determine with the student and the parent the best kind of way for them, what's best for them. Uh, we have lots of students that are working additional hours at part-time jobs. So can we get them co-op credits for that? Can we get them time for that? So it's ramped up and we're having to get more, um, uh, we're having to solve more puzzle pieces to, to move forward, yeah. That's a great amount of information, Ashley. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just going to switch directions just a little bit and come and ask Rich and Rob my initial question. What's the impact in your world? And then ask you then to take it away with a little bit more fulsome conversation, exactly the way Ashley has done. Sure. So, Rich, what's been the impact in your world? Well, Keith, I appreciate that. I, I feel like really honored to be here with two just incredible professionals, Ashley from the education space, Dr. Rob. Um, you know, although I run an overnight kids camp, we'll have about 2,000 kids come in a normal summer. We hire about 200 summer staff. Uh, really, I'm thinking about this from the seed of kind of outdoor recreation stuff in general. So it, it feels just honored that we get to sit at the table and have this conversation. You know, I would say there's two things that we've seen or I've seen from our seed uh, that would be shifts or changes. Pre-COVID, we used to talk to parents uh, about how an experience like ours was so good at building resiliency, it's so built good at building soft skills. Like there's something about getting away from home from mom and dad and trying things that you've never done before. There's something about that that um, is, is developmentally positive. And if I'm honest, uh, parents, I, we would say that and parents would look at us like, what are you talking about? Like, it's just sending your kid to camp. Like, what's the big <laughs> deal? It's not that big of a deal. And we're pretty passionate about it. We're like, no, no, this is a real big deal. But, but now, uh, we don't have to convince parents of how important those things are. We don't have to convince them that social skills are, soft skills are really important in a young person's life. That, you know, the ability to build friends is something that, uh, you know, that you can't just take for granted. That's something that you want to actually inject into your kid's life. You want to help them learn how to do that. You know, we, we I agree, I, there have been just such great, we've seen great resiliency with the young leaders, particularly that we work with uh, over these last few years. Uh, and you know, you want to set up opportunities for your children, young, young people, uh, to build that resiliency. And so uh, the first thing I would say, you know, where we've seen a shift, it's really more about the climate around kids that I think parents in what we do, whether it's overnight kids camp or a summer soccer league or you know, youth activity, youth sports, all of those things used to feel like great add-ons. They used to feel like a great, like, hey, that's a, that's a, a, a nice thing to have. Um, but even the fact that we're here, I think people have in the broader culture woken up to like, actually, that stuff's like really important. Like, and we've had two years where most, most kids in Ontario have lacked that, have not had those kinds mm -hmm. of experiences, or they've been greatly diminished. And I would say there's a concern. I've, we've got a concern around what the kind of long-term impact is. Um, so, that is I, so that would be the first area. You know, the second area we have definitely seen with our summer staff. So la we haven't run our traditional summer programs the last two summers. So we did family programming. We served about 10% of what we have normally would normally serve. So greatly diminished numbers of people that we've served. 
Um, and the first summer, we, we hire, like I said, about 200 students a summer. Uh, the first summer, um, we had to lay them all off. We weren't able to hire anyone. We were, and it was like financial downward spiral, like how, you know, we, that was our 74th summer that we had existed. And the thought of like, how can you run a summer camp without having summer? Like that, that just feels very strange. And so it was heartbreaking to, uh, to get in front of dozens of students who had been waiting uh, and to say, hey, like, sorry, we can't employ you this summer. Um, and I don't ever want to do that again. That was like one of those, I do not want to repeat that experience. Now, we had a number of students who, um, who said, oh, we'll still volunteer. We were still running programs trying to figure out how to do what we could do. We had a number of students step in and say, uh, well, we'll just volunteer then. You know, it's fine. You can't pay us. We'll just show up, which was just like heartbreaking. I'm like, yeah. wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, it was incredible. Now, last summer, we made that we, we didn't run the guidelines for overnight kids camps. Some, you might remember, some overnight kids camps did run last summer. Um, and we were one of the ones that chose to do a modified program, have a lot less. We had family programming for the summertime. The, uh, the, the actual guidance from the government came out two days before camp uh, opened. And so we didn't, couldn't prepare in two days to welcome 2,000 kids. Um, and so we stayed with family program, which was greatly reduced. But one of the things, and, we, and one of the good things about that, one of the main reasons why we did that was because we were able to retain all our summer students. We were able to guarantee them, we're still going to employ you. We're still going to uh, give you a job for the summertime, which was, was great. Now, a part of what we normally do, and we added this three or four years ago, um, was we provide a service to our summer staff. So not to our campers, but to our summer staff, where we have a counselor on our team, a, a professional therapist who uh, they can book time with every, uh, every week if they need to. Because being in a residential environment like ours where people are away from home, you know, stuff comes up, right? Their, their life, and it's a very social environment, and, you know, it, things bubble up that go beyond uh, our ability as staff to deal with that, and so we wanted to provide that. Um, and so we continued to provide that last summer. Now, normally, we, um, this counselor we hire for uh, one day a week. So he's with us for a day. And, you know, we, our staff book time slots with him. And normally, he would not kind of sell out a day. We, usually, he's just kind of kicking around for a couple hours, which is wonderful. Like, I'm, we're like, hey, we want that. We, we don't want to run out of capacity. Well, when we sent out the link last spring, uh, it was in June. Hey, if you want to book, you know, our counselor's going to be here again. Uh, we sold out first three weeks of the summer. Uh, he wasn't available. And so we had to like, double his time. So it went from one day to two days. Um, and we, we have, that's a, a, a one kind of thin slice into what we've seen with students. That the, the, um, the mental health issues are, are, I think they were always there, but we're seeing them more. Um, again, in our environment, it's a highly social environment, so those things do tend to bubble up. Um, we're happy to provide that service to our, our staff and are anticipating this summer even more than what we did last summer. So that, that's a couple of examples of things. Thanks for here. giving us a little window into your mm -hmm. world in the yeah. summer, and yeah. we'll now think what's going to happen this summer, and we'll yeah. get back to that. Yeah. Rob, your world? What is your world? I thought you were going to ask Rich a whole bunch more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, come, I'll come back. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know you will. But uh, first of all, let me just say thank you for inviting me here uh, again today. I know we were uh, we had a meeting on our health a about a year ago, and you reminded me of that just before we started today, um, and how nice it is not to be on Zoom. I am Zoomed out uh, <laughs> for the next decades of my life. So... Anybody in our audience here. disagree with Rob on that one? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody here like totally loves you? Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's so great. And it's nice to be able to see um, my, uh, the patients, my families and kids that come to see me in person again. Um, and it is just so much, so much better. Um, but, you know, I, I tell people I wear three different hats when I talk about my experience with COVID over the last two years. Um, you know, first as a dad, I have four kids myself, and they span sort of the late elementary school to um, high school years. Um, they'll all be teenagers in the next year. So, you know, uh, they've, they've, done, they've had graduations in COVID. They've had some significant life experiences in COVID, starting high school in COVID. They've had semester and quadmester. They've had class trips canceled. They've had drive-by birthday parties. And uh, it's, you know... At the beginning, there was a real coming together kind of feeling. You know, my kids did a lot of fun stuff during the first lockdown. I remember them 
just joking yes yesterday about how that first March break, remember that? Oh, March break is going to be two weeks longer. Uh, wow. <laughs> like, well, they, they, they know it was going to last for two years longer, really. <laughs> so that, that, was, um, that, that was an experience as a dad. You know, we also had COVID in our family. You know, my parents both got really ill right at the very beginning. My father was in the ICU for eight days, and he survived, fortunately. But, you know, so all of that thrown in there, like, that was my experience as a family and, and as a dad um, uh, of kids uh, going through COVID. Uh, something that's never happened in our lifetime and we never thought would happen. Um, the second hat was as a, uh, a hospital um, um, uh, in leadership position hospital, as a medical director. You know, we started up the family, child, and youth program at Waypoint in uh, January of 2020. <laughs> Good timing. So, you know what happened just shortly after that, right? Mm -hmm. Things just shut down. We went completely virtual, um, you know, for... A number of weeks there was a risk that we would have to shut down outpatient because we needed staff to be working on our inpatient unit. Uh, Waypoint took a huge number of patients from other areas of province to free up hospital beds in the GTA specifically, um, especially during the third wave, fourth wave, and I've lost track of waves, but you know, they keep on coming. And in fact, it looks like we're entering another little, hopefully little wave right now. We'll see what happens, but pandemic's not over yet. So that's, that's, you know, that was a real challenge too. And then lastly, of course, as a pediatrician, where I get to sit with families, um, it was a lot of times over Zoom. And um, I've seen everything. Um, and, it's, and it's been interesting because it has been a mixed picture. Um, you know, when schools first closed down, I think, like I said, it was kind of a coming together. And I, I was surprised. I remember t saying this to our um, hospital CEO. I said, it's interesting because, you know, there's a group of kids that actually seem to be doing great. <laughs> and I was kind of surprised at that. And then I realized, you know, that the, the kids that I tended to see even before COVID were, were the ones that were struggling, obviously, with mental health issues. And when schools closed down, um, I realized how much of a stressor the school environment had been for them. And going to school was difficult. And when schools shut down and they were online, that was a great experience for them. However, that was true for many kids. But I think for most kids, you know, schools being closed was really tough on their mental health. Um, and, uh, and it was good for schools to reopen. Uh, and, and, and they did really well. But for some kids, again, that was, a, that was a stressor right back in their lives again. And so it's been really interesting as the data comes out now on the effect on our kids' mental health. Um, you know, the, 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 the mantra we've heard is, you know, school is good for kids' mental health. And, yeah, that's true for, for most kids, but not for all kids. And so it's awesome to hear, you know, Ashley talk about the different options now for kids. You know, a hybrid, a virtual. We've been sort of accelerated into new ways of thinking about school, uh, the importance of camps, mm -hmm. you know, and, and other activities that kids should be participating in. We've just had a new appreciation for, like, let's think outside the box. How can we do things differently? Because going back to normal, you know, I don't think should be our goal. We should be going back to like, you know, well, we shouldn't be going back. We should be going forward to hopefully a better way of doing things. We should be taking some learnings from this pandemic and say, what can we do better? Some things have gotten, you know, gotten worse. You know, we, we, we saw anxiety and depression, but actually diagnosed like actually like disorder level anxiety, depression hasn't really changed all that much. A lot of self-reported anxiety, you know, a lot of self-reported worry and stress. And, you know, we've seen a lot of family struggle with job losses and sickness, et cetera. And, um, but, you know, a lot of that has come back as well. So it's less of an issue now. And it's nice to see many kids sort of bouncing back from that, you know, kids who are resilient. And I think overall the kids are going to be okay. Any um, big, really big surprises for you? Any big surprises? That you saw over the last couple of years that you hadn't anticipated or, and good or bad? Well, so in the area of mental health, you know, the, the, one of the biggest concerns we saw was the rise in eating disorders. Uh, that just went through the roof. And there's something about kids in isolation with an uh, excessive amount of perhaps toxic screen time at a time of overall general heightened anxiety. That was, I think, the perfect storm for eating disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many kids stuck at home uh, with, like, really a loss of all control and agency with a stressor that was the coronavirus 
um, really resorting to some maladaptive coping strategies of which eat disordered eating was one of them. And I think that really is still surprising to me. Like we're talking doubling, tripling of numbers of kids being seen at eating disorders clinic. The clinics here at RVH and OSMH are, are overwhelmed. They can't keep up. And so uh, there has been some emergency measures to deal with that surge, but that is just one example of a surprise. Um, and there are, there are other examples as well. You know, we, we, we were worried about really hard markers of depression, such as, you know, suicide rates and everything. Those actually came down during the pandemic. And we're still, like, thinking, like, hmm, you know, we would have thought that would have maybe increased. Fortunately, it has not. Um, but, you know, these are some of the data that's coming out right now that I think we're going to chew on for some time now mm -hmm. to try and figure out, like, what can we learn from this? And again, looking forward, how can we make things better? You know, how do we deal with eating disorders? Uh, how do we deal with, you know, depression, self-harm and substance use and things that, you know, Ashley mentioned they've seen an increase of? Yeah. Let's spend a little more time with each one of you on moving forward. And so I got a couple of questions I've saved, Ashley. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, so somebody sent this in, and they talked about supportive parent education. So is that necessary? Is it available? Um, because oftentimes kids get their behaviors from home. I mean, they model them, right? But maybe, maybe maybe the parents sometimes need some education or maybe that might be one of your helpful strategies is there anything formal that you set up or or, or are the kids your focus and uh so we have um i don't recall the date off the top of my head but we do have a parent um we have a guest speaker coming for a parent night that our parent council has arranged. Uh, the guest speaker is going to come and talk about sleep and the teenage brain um, and the value of having a routine and what that sleep routine looks like and, and just the value of sleeping um, and getting quality sleep. So yes, there are some in place. There could be more, absolutely. Um, and, and having kind of conversations with parents. I also know um, with teenagers in particular, there's usually a disconnect between what is being told at home and what, or or they're not communicating of what their day looked like or, or their, what happened in the day. And so when you phone a parent and have a conversation, they're like, oh, I had no idea. That sounds great. Or, or okay, we need to work on that. Um, and uh, so just opening up those lines of communication again. But no, like, yes, there's some supports for parents, but there definitely could be a great deal more. I, I can't imagine as a parent, and I'm lucky I might not have little kids, but, you know, worried about am I going to be able to put bread on the table? Am I going to pay rent? Am I going to get sick? And I can't, if I can't work, what do I do? And all of a sudden I've got my kids at home and I have to stay home and look after them. And what do I do? I can't work full time. I mean, those are horrendous problems. And... You know, how, how do you manage that as educators when you see it with the kids? I, I know there's one, like I would like to, um, the online learning shell for secondary is, is harder than the online learning shell for elementary. So elementary uses Google Classroom. It has like a running feed each day of a post. But in secondary, the shell, the, it's called Brightspace or D2L, the shell is much um, uh, more comprehensive to navigate. And then each teacher makes their own shell, and they've had training on that, but each teacher makes the shell according to, you know, how they want to lay it out. And I know um, navigating those shells with parents, especially after they've worked full, a full day and supporting their student at home, um, I would love to have, uh, be able to offer some sessions on how to use those shells um, for parents and how to educate them on, on where to find things. I know we're waiting for permission to be able to um, add parents to those shells through parent emails. Um, I, I, that's hopefully coming in the next week or so um, that we can start trialing adding parents to those shells, especially for our grade 9 and 10 students. I also know, um, you know, there's the dog ate my homework kind of, um, now it's, <laughs> my, I don't have my password, or I don't, or someone changed my password, there tends to be a little bit of, uh, the, 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 right, the conversation around, you know, I, I can't do this because I can't get access to it, um, and navigating those conversations about, um, in some cases, they're correct, they can't get access because of internet at home, but in other cases, it's like, oh, yeah, you can get some access, dog didn't eat your homework. <laughs> uh, so education around that, absolutely. I, 
I can't imagine, I'm in the education industry and I even know navigating different teachers D2L shells is, is a struggle because they're all different. And that's for me who can navigate it quite well. Um, so I, I can't imagine the challenges at home and the, I can appreciate the frustration when a parent calls saying, I, I attempted, can I just get a paper copy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was an article that I read the other day and it referred to guided play. And so it was <laughs> making things live yeah. that you're trying to teach them. So instead of talking about a tree in a book, you actually go on a hike. That's, that's probably a pretty uh, small example. But is that, is that something that's coming or is that, where, where, do, where do you go with that? Oh, I think we're already doing that. Okay. Um, in a, I, I hope in a lot of our classes, I just talked with my science teacher today about um, the grade nine electricity unit and building houses. And we were talking about a student that loves to play hockey. And so I said, well, then why doesn't she build a little hockey rink and, and, and wire in, you know, a penalty box and penalty lights and a scoreboard? Um, so I, I definitely know uh, a lot of our technology classes are, are very much in guided play, hands-on uh, learning, and I know um, I'm seeing it a great deal in, in many of my other classes. Um, and yeah our, yeah, our food, our technology-based programs. In elementary school, um, we haven't been able to get into our feeder elementary schools very much in the last couple of years, which is unfortunate. Um, but I love going to the elementary schools. And um, I was a math teacher, so you see some fantastic examples of them working with uh, math in different fields, so combining math and, and cooking or nutrition. And, and working out that. So I know in secondary we're doing that as well and I'm seeing a great deal of it. I would say that that's the one advantage also of, of if you're online, um, social media has, has the benefit of social media as it's helped with that. I see a lot of students that are making TikTok videos, um, useful TikTok videos <laughs> uh, for, for education. So it's, it's, I, I think it's happening and, and more will continue to happen. Okay. So that's a positive spin on social media. I did have that question for you, Rob, or, or Rich, whatever you want to make. Uh, is social media, like, social media is a lot different than it was five years ago. Yeah. And has it changed throughout this? And has it been good or has it been bad? Well, why don't we let those guys? Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I, I don't, yeah. Oh, social media, don't get me started. Um, you know, that, that's, that's interesting because... You know, when we talk about going back to normal, uh, you know, we don't really want to go back to that because social media was was an issue, I think, before the pandemic. Um, I think we've had a, we've heard a lot of things about you know social media over the last uh, few years, especially around you know responsibility of big companies trying to regulate social media. We've seen a lot of polarization happen on social media. We've seen a lot of you know. Um, uh, negative things come out of social media. We talk about like eating disorders, for example, you know, there's a lot of concerning sites and messages that are coming through that. Um, I, I don't want to be like, you know, the guy who just, just bar barrels down on, on social media. I think, you know, being able to keep in touch with your friends, uh, especially when we were locked down, was just hugely valuable. I, I told parents, you know, show a bit of grace to your teenager who wants to stay up at night, you know, a little bit later than normal because they're chatting to their friends because they're not able to get together the way they used to. Um, that's okay for now, you know. And I talk always about when it comes to screen time, you used to say, well, there's like digital candy and then there's digital vegetables, right? And, you know, the digital candy is the video games and the sort of mindless chatter that happens on social media. And then there's the vegetables, which is like the online learning. Because if you look at when the pandemic started, God, everything was online. We couldn't talk about screen time anymore because life was screen time. Mm -hmm. That's how we did our school. That's how we kept in touch with our grandparents. That's how we kept in touch with our friends. But, you know, it was also a place where not so great things happened as well. And that's what we have to watch out for. And how do we teach our kids to be responsible online? How do we teach them to be critical thinkers? How do we teach them to recognize, you know, what's real and what's not real, what's, what's a scam and what's not a scam? Um, you know, we, we have to be very careful with what we post online, recognize that once it's out there, it's out there. This is all, you know, great teaching that I think as parents we need to do, as educators, you know. Um, I'm not sure what your social media policy is at camp, but I'm sure, you know, you don't really, I mean, the goal 
is to... I and they bring their iPhones to Camp Ridge? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I don't want to cut Rob off, but like we... So at our camp, we don't let kids have their phones. They're not allowed. Now, some camps do. We've chosen to not. We sell it as a feature. We say, hey, you're going to get to come to camp and not have your phone for a week. Nobody else is going to have a phone there. And then, and we're not anti-social media. We post a lot of photos in the summertime of kids online. All the parents can, can consent to that if they don't want to. We just don't post their kids. Um, but we try to say to them, like, hey, it's a great time to be away from that. Like, hey, mm -hmm. there is a life outside of that. And it's only for most kids, it's only for a week. Like, you're going to be okay. You're going to survive. Um, and I know, Rich, because my kids have gone to a camp, yeah. too, where there was no social media allowed. And honestly, they, they, they loved it. Like, they, none of them complained about it. They were happy not to have at least the pressure of having to post something or keep a streak up. Um, you know, they've actually appreciated that they could just, and they're actually proud of themselves for being able to manage, you know, for a couple of weeks uh, or a week or two weeks yep. without their phones. And I think that's great. I think it's good. It's good for all of us, I think, to take a little fast every once in a while <laughs> from, our, from our devices. Yep. When you and I talked, Rich, we talked about camp as an opportunity to do something new, to do something different, mm -hmm. to feel good about what you do and to push yourself a little yeah. bit. When does it get too risky? I think I referred to you, I fell out of a canoe once and, and I didn't have a life jacket on. And I don't think and I that said, was don't good tell that I don't think that was good behavior. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how do you how do you yeah. you, know, you have to help kids learn? Yeah, and absolutely. that was a good learning experience for me. But where, where do you draw the line? What's good? Yeah, it's a great question, Keith. So we at a theoretical level, so we wouldn't really get into this with the kids. They don't really it's not the conversation we're having, but at a theoretical level, we are constantly trying to balance two things. One, perceived risk, and the other is competence. And what we're trying to do is increase perceived risk to match uh, campers' competence level. Um, and if you can get those two to match, something magical happens. They're on the very brink where they feel like, I don't know that I have enough skill to do what I need to do. And it's actually at that moment that the human mind opens up and you learn because you're like, oh, I need to learn something new right now. So all of our activities are based on um, basically a series of increased perceived risks that will help kids try new things. So use the example of the, you know, canoeing. You know, for some kids, just sitting in the canoe in the shallowest of water is enough. And we're excited for that. That's like you know, they cannot believe that they're there and that matches their level of competence. They're like, that's it, they don't want to do anymore. But, but we know that, you know, there's more that they can do there. They could paddle out to the island. We have this island out there that's, that feels like a long ways away when you're first there. Uh, but then all the way up to, we have a 10 day canoe trip where kids will go and be away from it all. Um, what we're trying to do is constantly try to increase the level of perceived risk so that, because actually there's something when you get out of your comfort zone, when you try things that you've never done before, that's really what we are. We're a platform of, hey, you're gonna try a whole bunch of things that you've never done before, and you're gonna learn a bunch of new things, and part of what you're gonna learn is you can do hard things. You can try things that you've never done before, and it's gonna be okay. Um, and so we're, we work with our, as we design our program, so at the design level, and then also at the, at the level of our staff, working on how do you increase uh, the kind of challenge for a kid. How do you, and we do that in an environment we call challenge by choice, ultimately, and we're not, you know, there's this, notion of like years ago it would be like the shaming some kid to do something like you got to do this you got to do this and that was a really a bad idea uh, <laughs> but the spirit behind that was the leaders were like oh we really want people to try things they've never done before now we don't do that anymore uh, but we do we give them the choice we would love for you to try this and every activity we try to um, talk to our instructors and our leaders about how can you up the, the how can we make it more difficult for a kid so they'll try something new. Uh, and that works on kind of as they march up through our programs, but then actually at the individual activity level as well. It's important. It's an important part of, of learning. It's called the adventure leadership model um, of learning. Great, thanks. Um, Rob, I said I'd try and keep the medical questions to a minimum, but I've got one here that I think is relevant. Um, there's been a lot in the lit literature about long-term COVID, long, long COVID, and there are kids that have had COVID. I don't know what the percentage is. It's not as many as adults, but there are a fair amount. Do you worry about long-term COVID? Are you seeing 
the anxiety coming out in patients that you see that you will relate to long-term COVID or give us some idea? I think at this point, that's a really tough question to answer, to be quite honest, because we're just learning about long COVID right now and what it is and what are risk factors for getting it. Um, you know, like literally like today, 100,000 people got infected. You know, we're not probably going to diagnose 100,000 cases of long COVID, you know, right. four months from now. Um, at least hopefully not. But it doesn't look that way. You know, it looks like it, it, there's something that happens. You know, we know that there are some inflammatory effects of the virus on various organs of the body, including the brain um, and other organs. So, yeah, there, there are going to be some kids who just, or some kids and some adults who just mount a stronger immune response, a, a greater cytokine response that potentially could cause more inflammation and then lead to some longer term effects, uh, aka long COVID. But we're just finding out about that and are kids more at risk for that or less at risk for that? If you're immunized, does it decrease your risk? Um, you know, is the variant that you're infected with a factor there at all? Are there pre-existing conditions? You know, for example, um, you know, is there, is there a propensity towards inflammation because of other factors that might increase your risk for developing long COVID? Um, we know there are certain populations who just did you know, worse with short COVID, let's call it. You know, there were definitely some subgroups of people, um, indigenous populations uh, and, um, you know, black uh, population in, uh, it was, was really more affected by COVID, had more severe disease. Why is that? So let's oh, more just spot a little bit. If you were to make a diagnosis of long COVID, you write that at the end of the chart. I think this is long. I haven't made the diagnosis what, yet, though. What, what, what would make you make that diagnosis? What kind of symptoms would make you? Look? Well, really, it, there, there is a, a, sort of a list of symptoms that would that uh, sort of are currently being um, put into this syndrome of long COVID, and uh, and of course it has to have, be a certain length of time uh, because you know it has to be long. So, and there's even debate about that. What is long? Is it four months, six months, 12 months? Um, so this is an evolving field where I think we're too soon in to really know about. I know a number of ongoing studies right now, so maybe you'll have me back next year and we can talk yeah, about long COVID. Yeah, well, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> or two years from now. That's fine, that's fine. The one thing we do know about is post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing that with COVID? Because, no, um, yeah. The, so yeah. post-traumatic stress, of course, refers to a specific, pretty specific set of criteria to yeah. make that diagnosis. Um, right. um, you know, it was, uh, it was first coined in, in war veterans who were coming back from mm -hmm. battlefields and who were having, you know, shell shock is what it used to be called. Um, and then it was formalized into a, a diagnosis, um, you know, in the, in the 70s, actually. Um, but I, I would say, you know, the, the, what we're seeing now would not really be PTSD, um, uh, unless you've had a, an experience like an ICU admission, for example. We have seen some ICU patients who have been really severely affected by that experience and have had PTSD. But really, most people who have gone through COVID don't really have PTSD from that. I would say they have more chronic, long-term, low-level stress, you know, and kind of societal stress that's impacted okay. them. So okay. that's what I've seen. I've just seen families just kind of having difficulty coping, kids difficulty coping, and, you know, the effects of that. Yeah, and if one thing we've all learned in, in the hard way sometimes is by ignoring it, oh, yeah, it'll get better, it'll get better, and it doesn't get better, and mm -hmm. that's a big challenge for those people who don't get better, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to pause for a second and just say thank you to our sponsors and tell you a little bit about our next program. Glenn, you were going to put some information up on the big screen about our sponsors. Okay, uh, we have seven sponsors who give us some money so that you people don't have to pay to come and attend. They also provide a huge amount of support for our, for our advisory committee. Those seven sponsors are the Center for Psychology and Emotional Regulation, headed by Anita Federici, Audi Hearing Aid Center with offices throughout Simcoe County, Waypoint Center for Mental Health Care, our newest sponsor this year, Hillcrest Village Care Center, a long-term care home managed by the Enns family. Mink Insurance, led by David Mink, now known as McDougal Insurance. Georgian Bay General Hospital, a longtime supporter of our program. And the Lipton Group, thanks to Lois Lipton and her uh, 
number of businesses. So thanks to all of our seven sponsors. Let's give them a big hand. Our next program is five weeks tonight. Let's put it in your calendar for May the 12th at 7.30 p.m. It's called A Good Life Includes a Good Death. We have three caring and compassionate panelists who strive to ensure good deaths for those in their care that are close to the end of life. There is uh, two representatives from Hospice Huronia, one the director and the other one a frontline caregiver at Hospice Huronia. Um, lots to learn about hospice care and what it means and palliative care, and they're going to tell us about those options. We have a physician, Tony Reed, from Morelia Soldiers Memorial Hospital, who is a maid, that's medical assistance in dying, assessor and provider. And again, um, he's not here to sell you on it, he's here to tell you about it. So we're looking forward to that event just five weeks tonight. We'll have that information out in the promotional very shortly. Okay, so we can come back. The promotion, the advertisement's over. Okay. <laughs> um, question that somebody sent in, and any one of you can take this. Why does it seem we're not all in this together anymore? It's not a level playing field anymore. Before, when two years ago, when we were getting into this, that was the, that was the mantra we talked about. We're all in this together. But now, now there's vaccinated and there's unvaccinated. There's people who've suffered. There's people who have thrived. There's parents who have lost their jobs. There's others who haven't. So the, the playing field is very, very different. How, how do you how do you call, how do you manage that? How do you talk to your students about it? How do you talk to your campers? I mean, because um, we can't use that mantra anymore. That's a great question. You know, I think what I see happening, even with the conversation we were having earlier around schools, uh, trying to provide unique solutions for kids, um, I, I think that's a real positive thing going forward. I think we've realized through this that, like, not everybody's the same. <laughs> you know, that <laughs> not everyone, and, and I don't necessarily think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think we're trying to figure out how we can live together. I think there is, for all of us, as in leadership, who are lead any organization, this has been a trying time. It's been trying to keep people together. I know for us, um, you know, we have a little staff team and, you know, hundreds of summer staff. We've tried to focus, uh, continue to keep our people focused on what is the mission? What are we called to do in our case? We're about developing young leaders. And so we've said that's the thing we want to keep focused on through this. And I think we all have to do that, in our, whether it's in our homes or in our you know, organizations that we lead. And I think this has been a trying season, but I think in some ways we just have to keep coming back to that as leaders. What is it that your organization's called to do? What is it that we're trying to do? In our, the, the part, the little plot of dirt that we're responsible for, how do we stay focused on you know, pushing that thing forward? And so for us, that's been our goal. I, don't, I feel terrible for the political leaders. I think I feel bad for them. I'm like, this is, I sometimes, you know, in the early days I was watching with great intent uh, all those, you know, all those times they would get up and talk and I, I would look at them and I'd be like, I don't think any of these people really wanted this job. I don't <laughs> think they, you know, this is a terrible time. And, and so I think some of that has happened, some of that division has, has, it's not like there's anyone to be blamed. It is the consequence of a series of decisions that have been made. Um, I think we can come out of this. I think Canadians are, I think Canada is an amazing place to live. I think the Canadian culture um, will bounce back from this. I think we will, we will end up in a stronger place uh, because of it. But that's going to happen with all of us who lead things, saying we're going to stay focused on how do we make it better for everybody, for all Canadians. And I, 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 I still actually believe in we're all in this together. I still, I think we, we can come back to that. I think we've seen a bit of the shadow side of our society come through over the last, because people, it's just been, it's been long, it's been hard. Everybody experienced the pandemic differently. Um, and we're going to need it again because we know other crises are going to come up. And it, it's been great to see actually many people come together supporting, you know, Ukraine, for example. That's our uh, current crisis. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got climate change that's going to happen, and we need to all come together for that too. Mm -hmm. I, I actually do believe that as a society, we can come together at times of crisis and 
what we've seen happen over a two hard years that uh, there, there was definitely struggling. It's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna see things fray at some of the edges. And I think one of our first priorities as we gradually come out of the pandemic, I know there's a little wave coming again, but you know, as hopefully we come out of this, is we should look at repairing our frayed relationships that are out there. I know that I have you know, experienced some relationship you know, breakdowns with people that I used to get along with very well before. And uh, I am going to prioritize repairing those relationships mm -hmm. and saying, look, you know, what, we've, what we had before is actually way more important. Um, you know, COVID got in the way. It, it revealed some differences in how we thought maybe and some ideology. And, but, you know, in the end, we're all human. We all want the best. Yeah. We all try and we cope as best we can. And we, we all need to show each other uh, some grace. And I hope that's one thing we can learn from mm -hmm. this pandemic. Ashley, any comments to uh, close this question on? I think that um, COVID for us brought to light or made really apparent a lot of the inequities that were already there. So um, like in terms of uh, internet use um, and stable internet connections um, for many individuals that geographically just don't have access to internet. And then you learn, geogra like in this area, geographically, they are on the bus for a long time getting to a school um, and you don't recognize that until you deliver them a paper copy of work to do and you're like, oh, you're, you live a ways away. Um, and food insecurities, so um, we, didn't rec we didn't realize, I guess. So I think for us it was brought to the forefront a lot of these, these, these uh, factors that were already there that we're now, I think, much more cognizant of. Um, and we have much better programs right now in our building for, for providing food um, for students. But um, I do agree that I see most of our, anyways, I'm around a lot of kids, so I see most of them coming together. I, I don't see a lot of them diverting right now. I okay. see a lot of groups of students coming together, and I see the leadership and the youth um, working out ways to support students, and I have we have initiatives running all all the time for different different climate change. Being one of a poster that's up today about um, and some challenges for that. Uh, we have um, uh, menstrual product. There's uh, we have many students right now providing um, access to affordable or free menstrual products in our building. There's there's lots of lots of initiatives that students are leading right now, saying these 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 things need to be supported for everybody. So, so you change the conversation to get them all on the same page. I think so. Yeah. 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 I think too some of that is connected to an earlier idea. Some of that division is artificially generated by social media. It's exacerbated. So the, the fringes are, and this is outside the scope of my area of expertise, but we're here, so we're talking. Um, <laughs> but those, the, the fringes are elevated, right? And so I think there is that center of society that is actually more connected than we think. I think the, the kind of fringe elements get more, because of the way those algorithms work, they get more attention because it aggravates us more and we want to, and we get mm -hmm. mad about it and so we'll click more, um, which is super negative, obviously, mm -hmm. long term, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know that that's actually the middle of you know, Canadian life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for your comments on that. Next one's, um, Rob, I'll let you start on then, but I'm, it affects all your worlds. Uh, where do unvaccinated and immune compromised kids, vulnerable kids fit in, in your schools? And in your summer camp and in healthcare, um, because it's a it's a group that they really are quite different. Mm -hmm. So where do they fit in, and how do you manage it? Who wants to start that? Rob, do you want to start? Well, you know, it, it, it's um, it's such a diverse group for diverse reasons, and it's hard to give one answer for that. You know, because we have unvaccinated young kids who just can't get vaccinated. Less than five, yep. Those, those mm -hmm. that uh, are choosing not to be vaccinated for various reasons or have contraindications to vaccination um, and immunocompromised as well, you know, they, they, they can't get the vaccine or even if they've had the vaccine are still more prone to, um, to getting infected and perhaps having a more severe outcome because their immune system is compromised. These are huge issues, you know, that are, there are no easy answers for that um, because, you know, um, locking down has costs as well. And, um, you know, so there's always this balance of, you know, protecting as many people from getting infected versus, you know, um, uh, the benefits that we have as 
as society by functioning, you know, and being open, etc. And so that's a challenge. That's a real challenge because sometimes they're, you know, different people have different views on that, and uh, ideology gets in there as well. And so, um, you know, we've seen that play out um, over the last several months. You know. Um, with uh, and and of course gets amplified on social media and so um, I, I think yeah it's not going to be easy as we move from this state of you know where where things are where the mandates are in place uh, and there's lots of restrictions to things kind of opening up and we're in this uneasy time right now where you know we walk into a grocery store and we see 50 percent of people kind of wear a mask and 50 percent aren't um, and uh, and. And you're like, well, what's that all about? And <laughs> how does that work exactly? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, we're, in, we're in this uneasy space right now where we're trying to balance that. And I think over time it will get, will get better. You know, we, we have seen subsequent variants sort of becoming milder and milder. We have more treatments now that are available. And, um, you know, we may get a, a better um, vaccines that prevent infection better, you know, mm -hmm. if, if boosters down the road. I suspect that's going to happen as well. So... You know, it's an, it's an ever-evolving and changing space, but eventually this will become an endemic situation where we are really going to have to learn to live with the virus, and that's going to be easier for some than for others. And again, we just need to show grace to those for whom it's, uh, it's more of a challenge. Okay. Um, coming back to the vulnerable population, mm -hmm. what do you do at camp? Do you, yeah, well, you can't isolate them. These are, these are probably the kids that will benefit the most from camp? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So our baseline is, and this would be the common of uh, overnight camps or uh, youth programs, we just want to create a place where every kid in Ontario can go. Like, what, that's our baseline. Our opening position is like, we want to do what everything we can to create the kind of opportunity for kids that would be amazing for them. Now, health and safety is a huge priority for us. It always has been. We have a history of exceeding the regulations in this area. Um, because we're caring for people's children <laughs> and it's like we and they're overnight with us so that we, you know so by actually by regulation I'm, I'm pretty sure the actual regulation says we only need someone with standard first aid to open which is crazy when you think that we'll have you know at our peak time we'll have 650 people on the property um, we don't do that we have three nurses on staff uh, plus some weeks we have a doctor uh, plus a nursing student. We've actually made changes during COVID that's been super helpful on this front. We actually do have isolation rooms now. We didn't have those mm -hmm. before. Um, we had kind of like open wards in our, in our health area, but we've actually been building to, to make spaces so that we can be you know, more isolated. Um, we work with families uh, if, if they're, and this is true of any kind of exceptionality, we'll work with them and try to describe this is how our program works. This is what we do. Uh, and we will um, want to do whatever we can to ensure that your kid can enjoy it. Um, and some kids, it, whatever the end, whether it's immunocompromised, um, we may not be able to meet a standard that works for that family. And so that's a bummer for us. We don't, we don't like to come to that conclusion, but we try to work real practically with parents um, around that. So you know, we, it's been, a, a, I would say it's an area that we have worked on and lots of organizations have worked on it. COVID has actually accelerated the work in this area, which I do think will be a benefit for us long term. There, you know, we, we don't want kids to get sick at camp. We want them to stay healthy. And so I actually think we'll, we'll actually be one of the, the blessings of COVID will be that we'll be a healthier organization because of some of these changes uh, to try to help all kids. So what things do you have in place, Ashley, for, because you're going to have immunocompromised kids. I mean, how many kids at high school? A thousand kids? What have you got up there? Yeah, about that, about 960, that. yeah. And, uh, and you're going to have kids that aren't vaccinated. You're, yeah. yeah. Um, so I would say the same thing. We follow, we're, we follow our regulations from the health unit and from the government uh, as, long, as well as our, our board. Um, so up until before March break, you know, mask mandates were in and students, we had arrows and we had really good, pol we had actually all our doors locked. So um, for public to stay out um, with, with the releasing of those mandates, um, students now have the choice for a mask friendly environment. So I would encourage or have a conversation with the family about if a student was immunocompromised that they, you know, choose to continue to wear their mask um, for their safety. Um, we have isolations, we have an isolation room. Um, if students feeling unwell, we are fogging spaces with, um, or sanitizing spaces. If a student's been in a space and unwell, then we, you know, the class goes for a walk and we fog those spaces. Um, so we have a number of protocols 
protocols still in place that, you know, I wonder if this isolation room will continue, if students continue to feel unwell. It's a great, um, it's a nice little room for them to go to and an administrator stays with them while they're in that space. Parents are called for them to come pick up. Uh, we're always having open dialogue with parents, discussing what's the best plan. So, is these are these classes the best for the student? Are these um, are these great? We as hybrid, some students maybe are choosing right now. So, we have about 30 to 40 learners that are still fully online um, that have chosen to stay home, um, and they don't feel comfortable coming into the building right now, um, and and that's their right. So, uh, we're supporting their education that way and connecting them that way. So, as we move forward we'll continue to do that I, I think that the conversation about online learning will continue for next year so um, and we adjust as need be okay we always get a lot of questions on so you recognize a child has a problem how do they or their parents get help what kind of resources like, like when do you make the decision this this needs more than a parent a loving parent to fix this what, what kind of symptoms would lead you to that? And I know we put a list of resources in our handout, and I love lists of resources, but I almost felt when I looked at it, I thought, well, this is like going to Yellow Pages to look for a doctor. And I don't do that. <laughs> like, I like to know which one our experts would recommend and which ones you've had success with of where to, where to go if you need some help or to send, send the families if you need some help. Rob, can I put you on the spot on that one? Yeah, like, um, you know, first of all, when we think about helping a child, we gotta think about what are we surrounding that child with. When we started the program at Waypoint, I was intentional about putting it as family, child, and youth. Because you can't really treat kids' mental health without thinking about the family. And, um, and that is more than the nuclear family. That's actually extended family. Um, I think we have to really start thinking again about, you know, what, who are the people that are surrounding this child? And that's teachers, that's coaches, that's parents, that's aunts and uncles, that's grandparents. I think, you know, one of the things that was really harmful to the opinion was the isolation, you know, the, the, the being alone, the not connecting. We're social creatures and we need that. And so we need that connection. We need relationships. And so we need to think about, okay, how do we surround this child with, with healthy, nurturing relationships? Um, so that, that's one thing, right? Home has to be a safe place. It has to be a secure place. Um, you know, we, we need to help the, the, the parents. Um, uh, we need to help the whole family when a child is, is struggling. Because if a child's struggling, it's prob prob likely that, you know, the whole family is, is uh, being impacted by that. So I think we need to take more of a broader approach and just say, okay, what's the diagnosis for this child? And stop focusing so much on a diagnosis for a child and think about what's the diagnosis of, this, of the environment around a child. I think that's a much healthier way of looking at it. So we just start doing that and then think, okay, what are, what are some helpful things that, or what are some helpful people that can come around a child? So getting them involved in activities like sports where there can be mentors and, and, uh, and uh, going, you know, to camps or day camps, you know, where they meet great leaders who can be, have a huge impact on their, li on their lives. Um, Sometimes you need to get professional help. There's some great counselors out there. Most of the family health teams I work with have counselors associated with them. The nurses have more uh, mental health support as well. And, uh, sorry, the schools have, me have more uh, mental health support as well. So it's, uh, it is, it's, you know, there, there's increasing awareness of those kind of level of support. But even just like our general awareness of you know, mindfulness and being uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. You know, we we should be teaching kids how to how to self-regulate, how to calm themselves down when they're feeling anxious and and, and stressed about something. Um, I, I think you know, right from the very beginning, um, we we talk about reading, writing, and arithmetic. We should like the fourth R should be regulation. Like we should be doing that right from JK mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. onwards. So. Yeah, there's, there are some great, you know, formal resources that I could point you to. Like there's, uh, you know, New Path and Canark in our area. There are the family health team counselors. Uh, that's publicly funded. There's a number of private counselors as well. But really it starts, you know, with that immediate circle of people that are around a child and around a family. And I think, 
you know, we missed that during COVID, and I think we need to start looking for those resources again. Okay, so thanks for those suggestions. I know somebody else said probably the family doctors, for most who have a family doctor, is probably a good place to start too. I think that somebody mentioned that. So, in your world, Ashley, when you recognize they might need some help, how do, how do you? You probably have to go through the parent, but they'll, they'll probably be asking, "Well, what do I do? What what do, what do you tell them?" For the parent? Yeah. No. Um, for, for the, the student. To, how do they get help for their child? Yeah. Um, so again. It, it, to, it's, it becomes a, a multifaceted view um, or look at it. So um, is, what is the student exactly struggling with? And so then that becomes the conversation. Um, is, it, is it negative peer interactions? Is it an eating disorder? Is it a substance? Uh, is there mental health? Or is it you know, a lack of confidence? Is it fear of work? Um, and schoolwork, um, that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, it becomes a, I think the first, the first piece is uh, we at the school have a conversation with, with the students caring adult or we learn, then we have a conversation with the student about their interests and what's going on in the classes. Um, you know, when we're talking with a parent, it becomes, um, there, we have many resources. So is, is, it a, is it, do we get them involved in, in a leadership? or in a school sport or a club or an activity? Is that gonna help build their confidence? And, and what does the parent need for that? If the parent's struggling just getting them to school or in, in the building in the morning, how can we support that? Um, so it's a very fluid back and forth conversation. Again, yes, we have social work and we have um, mental health and addictions nurses and we have, we have lots of, of, of supports in the building for students. Um, when they're over the age of 12, that if they don't give me permission to tell their parents that they're accessing those supports, then I can't disclose that to their parents. So, um, you know, that many people wouldn't be aware of. Um, that So there are many students that I will be having conversations with that I, I'm having a different conversation with their parent and I can't disclose that that, that referral's gone in and that they've chose to spoke and they're speaking with a counselor um, unless the, the student decides to tell their parent that. Um, and, and so I know that that sometimes can be a barrier too because um, you know that open line of communication with parents isn't as open and secondary as it might be in elementary. <laughs> um, so you know and you're, you, you're thrilled the students made the decision to seek out supports and help um, but that becomes a challenging conversation with parents or you can't have that conversation with parents. So um, but uh, you know, opening the lines of communication and, and the tiered team approaches is, is ideal. Do, is there one specific support? No, there's yeah. there's many. Yeah. Yeah, but it's impressive to hear the number of supports. I guess, to me, it's just the complex world of mental health. In you know, other a single diagnosis is very difficult. It's not just one person that's involved. It's multiple. There's multiple levels here, um, and multiple multiple treatments. So this is pretty complex stuff. I can see why you switch from pediatrics to mental health, Rod. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, that's the, but this thing though, right? It. it it shouldn't be complex, it, it, and that's one of the, I think, the not so great things about our mental health system is that there's so met, much complexity in so many doors, it, it should be easier, and I think that's one of the things that we're trying to change on a systemic level is, you know, kind of one door and, and, and one point of access, and then having somebody help you navigate kind of what, what you need. And again, the focus on a diagnosis to get help, I, I'd like to get, a, get away from that, you know, I'd, like, I'd rather focus on um, what are, what's the difficulty? What is it exactly, as Ashley was saying, what is this, what's the difficulty? Whether we call it this diagnosis or that diagnosis, um, you know, in mental health that's already so subjective. Um, let's think just practically, what is the difficulty here and what you need help with now? So the mental health system shouldn't be complex and difficult to navigate. You've already got enough stress on your plate, let alone navigating a complex system. So that's something we can do better. Okay. You know, thinking about the resource question in a slightly different manner, I, I've appreciated, we've talked in this conversation tonight about things like camp and thinking about the resource situation from a slightly different angle around, you know, maybe there's families that are struggling saying, I would love my kid to 
participate in something like that, but I'm not sure how we can do that. Like, and oftentimes that's a financial barrier. Like that's, yeah. that, that is a piece of the puzzle that we need to overcome. So there's two things I would say on that. First of all, there's a great organization. If you're, there's, there's hundreds of camps in Ontario and you're trying to figure out, okay, which one on the camp side, which, which one should I send my kids to? There's an organization called the Ontario Camps Association. That's a standards-based organization that, um, it's like a seal of approval. That's a good organization. You can literally just go to OntarioCampsAssociation.org, I think it is, um, and you can find camps that are, that are great. Now, I'm going to let you in on a secret here, Keith. I'm going to let your people know something. People who run camps love kids. <laughs> That's not, not a secret, hopefully. <laughs> and we just want to see kids come to camp. And if you're, and this is, I say this about my camp, and I say this about, there, you find all kinds of camps out there. If you're struggling financially, reach out to the camp and say, I want to come, but I, I, I just can't afford this. And most camps have some sort of bursary program where, and I know I say this and our finance people don't like it. I, I'm like, <laughs> we are not going to turn a kid away because of finances. We'll figure out how to make it happen. And so we have, we have a sponsorship program. We're not the only ones. There's lots that do. Um, but you do as a parent, you may need to lean in a little bit and say like, hey, this is, a, this is an issue. Um, and if you do that, you'd be amazed. And that's the same with, you know, youth, you know, sports and activities. You know, don't let finance, if you're a parent that's listening in and you're like, I, you think, man, I need to get my kids into an activity this summer, please don't let finance be the thing that is in the way. Reach out to these organizations. They're run, run by caring people who want to care for your kids. Uh, and you'll, I think you'll be surprised. Most will say, yeah, yeah, we'll figure it out. Let's, let's figure out what that looks like. They'll work with you to try to figure out whether that's payment plans or, you know, bursaries mm -hmm. or whatever to try to, to try to make mm -hmm. it accessible. Okay, that's great. Great information. Thank you for all of those things. And it's not a, I know it's not a simple question, but um, it's, it's complicated, but that's not an excuse for it. We just, <laughs> when, when you're in the situation that you need some help. Um, talk to us about protesting, kids protesting. So how much protesting is good? Because you want them to... If they don't like wearing a mask, you'd actually like them to express that rather than go in the back corner and just take it off. You'd actually like them to... The, the, where, how much do you let them express themselves? Who's listening? And where, where do they... Where, how far do you let them go? Ashley? <laughs> uh, um, so, protesting. Oh, that's a great question. So collectively as a protest, I haven't seen much of that from a okay. student, student population standpoint. Um, individual protesting, absolutely, um, daily. Uh, in terms of um, who's listening, uh, I, I feel it's always the, the students are watching to see if that student, is, if that behavior was okay. So then there's, you know, you always have the people watching. Um, yeah, but it, masks, I would say um, masks were difficult to, for students to stay, to keep them on. There was a lot of noses. I saw a lot of noses. <laughs> um, uh, now it's quite funny, or it's interesting, when they don't have to wear masks, we're still seeing them. <laughs> so <laughs> makes sense as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, I, I'm... You know, there's some protesting of, of movement around the school, um, but collectively, now those are gone. The protocols of, of arrows and, and process is gone. Um, I would say on a whole, I, there was a lot less protesting than I expected, and uh, it just got it fatiguing at the end. So initially off the bat, um, you know, in the September of 2020, yeah, September 2020, uh, students were, were in our building and they were awesome. They were fo following protocols really well and super supportive and understanding. As, as the pandemic went on and, and this past, just before March especially, um, yeah, they were fatigued. Yeah. Rob or Rich, any comment on the yeah, protest we, movement? It's funny you say that. Like our, so our mission is actually to develop tomorrow's leaders through life-changing adventure, one of the things we, we talked about. And so for years, we've dealt with this issue. Because when you say you want to develop young leaders, what happens is you get young leaders. And <laughs> the great thing about young leaders is they would like to lead. Not um, always team players. <laughs> and so I say that tongue-in-cheek, and I, hopefully leaders who are watching if there's any leaders that are watching, they know that I love them dearly. Uh, but, but we do get this. You get, um, and a part of what, what we do is try to work with 
uh, students who will we'll call them passionate about particular areas and issues is to try to help them understand how to communicate in a way that will win the conversation rather than lose relationship. And so, um, you know, that, that is, it happens more often than you'd think. Like if people do, and it's maybe not protesting in the sense that you're, we don't have people burning things at the stake or anything like that, but it's the aggressive kind of conversation. And so part of what we want to do is to help students figure out how, how do I communicate in a way that actually will ultimately kind of gather community rather right. than break it down? And so it is a, it's actually a normal part of what, <laughs> of what we what do. What do. Okay. Um, so we've, we've seen okay. that. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's oh. great. It's great for seeing teenagers express themselves. Yeah. And, you know, that's a really great thing. I 100% support it. And exactly what Rich said, how do you do that in an effective way, yeah. you know, to actually lead change? Mm -hmm. That's a great skill we want to. Mm -hmm. in, in, you know, instill in our kids. Um, our time is passing. I have one final question, and uh, keeping the eye on the time, but it's a personal question for each one of you. How do you stay positive? Because it's really evident to our audience, I think, that you are very positive people. And I didn't know any of you, oh, except for Rob, a little bit before. So that's great. But, but how do you stay positive? Because you must have had some down times. What do you do to get yourself back up? Hmm. Who wants to handle that? Rich? Well, there, there have been dark days the last two years. So we, um, as an organization, March, April of 2020, um, we stared down, like we may not exist anymore. Like we, we stared down some really, really dark days. And um, that was tough. That was very hard. And so for me, uh, we're a nonprofit. I report to a board. My board chair was a good friend of mine before this uh, and is now, you know, I have a small slice of understanding of what it must be like for people who go to battle somewhere where you like become you can become kind of melded together with those friends and uh, We had this one particular and we don't get into all the details We had one particular day that we still joke about to this day where we're like wow I it, it, Nothing was as bad as that day. We'll, we'll be able to get through it um, So I think community is a big part of that, you know part of staying with people who are positive and people who will lift you up, I think, is important. Counseling has been a, a critical part of the last two years for me. Actually talking it through um, with, with a professional is, is a critical piece of the puzzle. Um, someone who has a little bit of distance from, from the issues. But I'd say those two things. Community has been huge. You know, leaning in on, with other people who uh, can lift us up and not, you know, not be, fight against the isolation, not be on our own is a big piece of it for me. And Ashley, how do you keep your hope up? Is it personal hope or community hope? Like, are you talking about I'm talking me about individually? You. I'm talking about you because you okay. as a leader okay. are going to, the kids are going to mirror what you're doing, right? right? Uh, so uh, a couple things. So I would say I'm, I'm meditation and meditation through yoga. So I definitely have been able to maintain um, yoga at least minimum once a week. Um, I also have a beautiful dog and have been around animals my whole life. Um, I was fortunate to have horses when I was younger. Uh, so I would say that um, sometimes, I would say that in many cases, um, you know, the joy of coming home and seeing your, and, to, and then going for a walk and getting exercise and being out in nature. Um, I would say that that between meditation, yoga, and, and being out in nature with animals is, is probably the areas that I can stay positive. Okay, Rob? Yeah, as I said earlier, you know, uh, connections, uh, human connection is is key to stay positive. Uh, I think isolation was hard, and I, I echo what Rich said. I, I, I know there have been some tough days too, some long days and some lonely days, And but I'm grateful for my family. Um, the first of all, uh, I work with great staff at the, our organization. We take wellness very seriously. We support one another. We, we try to... Uh, recognize when someone's having a hard day that we just take time out and talk with them and really, you know, connect. Um, and so that's that's been great. Our, our church has been really a positive environment for, for us. Um, and so, you know, those, those things um, I think are key. You know, we've 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 maintained connection with some really close core group of friends, um, and and we've that that's been that's been huge. But you have to be intentional about that because. You know, those relationships often need, they need nurturing, they need, you know, development. And uh, so being intentional about maintaining those circles and uh, those cores has been, has been um, vital for my down days mm -hmm. uh, for someone to check in with me and say like, hey, how's it going or how are you doing? And then I can do that in return. 
uh, to others when, when they're struggling too. So that's been good. Well, thanks for sharing. It's inspirational to listen to you. It's great. Thank you. Um, and so now's the kind of when I need to, to wrap up. Uh, I do want to thank our wonderful audience. Give yourselves a big hand, wonderful <laughs> audience. <laughs> It's good to see you here. Um, I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as the four of us did on the stage. Uh, I want to specifically thank our speakers, Ashley, for somebody that uh, I didn't know until yesterday morning. <laughs> uh, you've done a great job of pitch hitting. Uh, thanks, for Haley, for offering, but uh, you've, you've, um, you've done very well. I really appreciate how quickly you've adapted to our format and uh, I hope I didn't throw you off with what I told you yesterday morning and what I told you no. tonight but it's been great having you very much appreciate your comments so well, thanks thank for you. having me Rich we've never had a camper on this show before you are a first but you're first in many ways really appreciate your forthrightness your comments uh, it's been great having you here so thanks big round of applause and Rob, as always, your wise and helpful comments. Uh, complex situations, but willing to look at each one and try and figure it out. Um, we appreciate you coming back, but you know what? We really look forward to having you here again, too. So thanks very much, Rob, Happy for being here. here tonight. I also want to again thank our seven sponsors who uh, really make our program, um, and we so much appreciate them. Um, if you want to give us some feedback, you can do that. You can email me. You can email us at uh, MCC, our health website. Just look there, and they'll tell you where to give your feedback. So I uh, would appreciate that. Uh, the program will be available uh, to view for all of you uh, at, uh, within two or three days, and uh, we'll get that information out on how you view it and how you see it. Uh, We'll see you again on Thursday, May the 12th. That's five weeks from tonight for a good life includes a good death. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Think it's okay to drive high? Think again. Drug impaired driving is as illegal as drunk driving. And in Ontario, the penalties are the same. 